Hey guys, so my name is Tim and welcome to the artist guide to the CG industry. So I'm making this guide because when I started out doing 3D as a hobby and when I was studying, I was super confused about all of the possibilities that were there inside of the CG industry. I mean, the CG industry is so big, you could do basically anything. And when I started out, when I was 14 and I was just making some simple animations, and then when I started doing it as a study and, and I con continued improving my skill, I wasn't quite sure what all the possibilities were within this industry. So that's why I'm making this video to help out you guys who are in the same situation to, so to sort of talk you over all of the possibilities that are there if you want to work within CG and kind of point you in the right direction to what you should aim your skills at whenever you are trying to get a job in this industry. So to all of you who are new to the channel, welcome. So my name is Tim and I am a uh, CG generalist uh, mit, mit, with a main focus on effects inside of Houdini. I've been working as a freelancer for about five and a half years. And before that, I was doing motion design, both 2D and 3D motion design, uh, before I transitioned doing freelance work and having a uh, bigger focus on doing Houdini. So uh, I've seen quite a few different uh, parts of the industry uh, because now I also do visual effects work. I've, I've done stuff in animation, I've done stuff in motion design. So uh, that's why I kind of wanted to make this sort of this, this video to kind of uh, really explain the different types of industries that are possible within, within CG uh, and what you should expect of, of each of those and the types of uh, work that you're, that you're gonna be doing. So before we get into it, I really want to ask you to, to gently, gently tap the like button. That, that really helps out the YouTube algorithm. Like just gently tap it until it turns blue. Because it helps out the YouTube algorithm. More people get to see this video. More people get educated on the CG industry. And that makes the whole CG industry better. So everybody wins. So if you would do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, but yeah, but without further ado, let's just dive into uh, whatever I'm going to discuss. So when we're talking about the CG industry, I'm going to break it up into six different parts that I'm going to discuss individually. Uh, you could probably break it up into more parts or less parts, but these are just six industries that I think are major industries that some of you might get involved in. Uh, if you miss something here, just let me know in the comments, of course. Uh, but these are the major industries that I want to break it up in. So these industries are animation, visual effects, motion design, architectural visualization, scientific visualization, and games. So I'm going to discuss the first three in most detail because animation, visual effects, and motion designs are the ones that I personally uh, work in and I know the most about. So most of the effort on the video is gonna be in those areas, but I'm also gonna discuss all of the other areas just as, just as a more brief overview. Um, and I will probably do future videos going more into depth on each of these individual elements. So if you have questions regarding any of these industries, like for example, if you want to know more about visual effects or about motion design, let me know in the comments and I will do a future video going more into depth than I can do in this video. Because as you already noticed, this is quite a long video already. So we got a lot to cover. So any, like if I go more in depth, it's going to be in a separate video. So let's first talk about animation. So if, if we're gonna refer to 3D animation, or it can be 2D animation if, if, if that's your thing, but generally then we're talking about uh, fully 3D animated uh, movies. Can be short films, can be uh, uh, game cinematics, uh, can be full feature films, can, can be any of the sorts. But when we're talking about animation, we're gonna generally talk about something that is fully CG. So, and that, that that doesn't mean that there cannot be live action elements implemented in, in a 3D animation, because there, there might be. Um, and I mean, some, like some genres might have like very, might be very like in the middle. But in general, animation is anything that's, that has a, as a base, has a fully animated 3D or 2D elements. So that's different from visual effects where live action, as an example, is the base element. But in animation, it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be fully animated. So you have some of these companies who try to get their movies uh, into live action category because, for example, if you're talking about, let's say the Oscars, there's a separate category for animation, which is just one category, which is, in my opinion, a little bit weird because uh, within animation, you could also have these separate uh, 
categories. Just for example, why Disney tried to push their Lion King movie, or like the new Lion King, uh, into live action. They called it a live action movie, even though it's a fully animated movie because it's uh, well, it's fully CG, but they made it look very photorealistic. So that was their way of saying that. Well, it's it's live action, but it's not live action because it's animated. So there's kind of these 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 distinctions. So within animation, of course, this is very broad. Animation can be anything from something super abstract uh, to something super photorealistic, and of course wherever you're going to be working um, gonna require a specific skill set for example if you get hired to work at Pixar for example doing something um, they make cartoons but they do have very realistic lighting uh, while some other animation studios might have for example animated movies which are very stylized very stylistic for example you could have like the the, the animated spider-man movie which is of course also fully 3d it's a fully animated movie, but it's a very different style. Um, and of course, your skill set's going to depend on whatever you're doing. In animation, generally, animation is done a lot in Maya. Um, of course, there's also other programs that, that can be used. But this is one of those examples where there are studios using Cinema 4D for animation or Blender or whatever. But it's just the industry mainly uses Maya for this type of stuff. And then, for example, Houdini is used to doing to do FX type of stuff. And then depending on the size of your studio or wherever you are, there are additional tools being used for, for example, rendering, like some big studios might use Katana for rendering or scene assembly. Uh, Pixar has, has its own tools uh, and well, a lot of other studios also have their own tools. But generally Maya is very big in, the, in animation, same for visual effects. Uh, so like if you wanna get into feature animation, and you're now using, for example, Cinema 4D. Cinema 4D is a great program, but it might not be the best if you want to actually get into feature animation. So there's 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 stuff like that that you could probably need to consider. Like, especially if you're a character animator, um, character animation is almost always done inside of Maya. Uh, I don't do any character animation, so I cannot say specifics on why Maya would be the best. I, I heard that the graph editor is good and it has a whole bunch of other cool features, but I don't do character animation, so I cannot really judge for that. I mean, when I'm doing animation type stuff, I just do it in Houdini and it's fine for me, but that's obviously very different from doing character animation. So those are things that you need to keep in mind. So if we're talking about visual effects, we're, we're instead of uh, having fully CG uh, animated plates, generally in visual effects, we're talking about having a live action plate, so something that's being shot in camera on set with, with actual actors or, or, or whatever. Uh, and then we're gonna use CG elements on top of our live action plates to enhance it. And that enhancing can be anything from Oh, there's a shadow over there that we don't want. Can you can you remove it? So that's a very simple thing. Like nobody watching the actual final result will know that there used to be a shadow there because it's not there. So that's something that is an invisible effect. And another type of invisible effect could be set extension. Like, oh, we have this building there, but there need to be two extra floors on top of this building. Well, you add it on top when someone watches the final result. There are extra buildings there, but nobody knows that those don't actually exist. Or they can be really obvious, like uh, like uh, dinosaurs or uh, or or very big explosions or stuff stuff like that. And generally, if you hear people hating about ah oh, visual effects make movies worse, they are generally referring to that type of stuff, which is very obvious because there's a lot of visual effects that people don't even notice are visual effects which can be very well done. The main thing you need to be good at if you're gonna work in, in visual effects is photorealism. So it's very important to know how to make stuff be photoreal. So a very interesting video about, uh, about this is actually a video by Roy Baker called The Art of Compositing. And he did a short video showing what compositing is in visual effects. So it's, and compositing is essentially integrating elements into uh, live action plates or removing them from live action plates. So set extensions, removing logos, uh, taking renders from 3D 
and integrating them into your uh, into your 2D live action plate. Can be any of those things, um, but that's going to be compositing. And generally, if you're, for example, going to work in feature film, generally you have a 2D department which handles compositing and you have a 3D department that handles the 3D. So the 2D, part, 2D department will take renders that the 3D department makes and then integrates them in compositing. So if you're going to be doing compositing, in feature film, generally what's being used is Nuke. It's just the biggest tool out there. Uh, some studios use Fusion. A lot of freelancers use Fusion. Um, After Effects isn't really used in visual effects. Uh, it is mostly a motion design tool. I mean, you could, you can composite in it. I mean, I've composited in it, but it's just, it's not being used, especially not like if you're gonna do feature film, it's not used at all. Like at least in the visual effects department, the motion design department might use it. Um, but compositing is gonna be using Nuke. Um, so they're gonna take stuff from the 3D department and integrate it onto the live engine plate. So skills for compositing um, are gonna be, of course, being gonna be very different than skills for doing 3D. If you're gonna composite, you're gonna need to know a lot about a lot about color profiles, lens distortions, uh, tracking, a whole bunch of other stuff. So there's a whole bunch of channels on YouTube that are know a lot about those stuff. Uh, I think Hugo Guerra does uh, does a lot of nuke tutorials. So I'll leave a link to his channel in the description. So he does nuke tutorials and stuff like that. Uh, if you're interested in that, I guess you could follow him. Um, for 3D stuff, I guess you could stay on my channel because I do uh, I do a whole bunch of 3D uh, 3D tutorials, also some compositing stuff, but I'm not mainly a compositor, of course. So if you're working inside of visual effects, generally uh, you're gonna be a specialist. So it depends on the size of the studio, but what I mean by that is that in um, where, for example, in motion design, a lot of people are generally generalists. And by generalist, I mean someone who does a little bit of everything. And then if you're a generalist, you, you will probably still have some specializations, like stuff that you're, that you're especially good at. Like you could be a generalist and you could be really good at modeling, for example, or sculpting or something like that. Or you could be a generalist and really good at lighting and shading. But you're still going to do everything. You're going to do a little bit of compositing. You're going to do a little bit of uh, modeling, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But in visual effects, generally people tend to specialize in a couple of areas and then that's going to be what they mostly will be doing. So kind of important to sort of find your, your niche, something you really like doing. Like, do you like creating characters? Like you, you might, might dive into ZBrush and learn how you can sculpt and then retopologize your characters, um, stuff like that. Do you like working with lights and like you might you might start getting into lighting and shading? Do you want to do simulations? You can gonna get into effects. Uh, but there's gonna be specializations there. For example, if I'm talking about myself, like I mainly get hired as a freelancer for FX type work. So mainly for simulations. So that depends, it depends on if I even render those myself. Like a lot of times I will do a simulation, then I will export it as a Alembic, for example, or as a P2B, and I will give it to someone else and then someone else will light and shade it. On some other jobs, I will light and shade it myself and then I will give it to a compositor and then the compositor will composite it. Or I might composite it myself, but my main thing is FX. And don't worry if you don't know what you want to specialize in. For me, it took a very long time to find my specialization. Like I said, I didn't find my specialization up until I discovered Houdini. Um, well, just a little bit before. Uh, back in 2014, I really discovered that I really wanted to do more with simulations. I was always interested in simulations when I started doing 3D for the first time. I was getting into fume effects and ray fire and stuff like that. And I always found that interesting. I'm still, I think I, I might still have a file from way back where, where I made some water with glue 3D in 3ds Max. Like when I really discovered Houdini, I was like, yeah, okay, this is going to be my thing. So that that's when I really, when it really took off for me to really, I really found my specialization. Some people find it very early. Some people find it a little bit later. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like I have quite range of, of uh, like for myself, I, I started as being more generalist. So I have a wide range of skills. Uh, and now I focus more on effects, but I still know a lot of stuff about some other things. So 
don't worry if you don't know specialization but it's something to think about if you're gonna be working in visual effects like what do i want to do so about tools i know some of you might really like cinema 4d or blender or whatever but the truth of the matter is in visual effects cinema 4d is just not used some places might use it for some stuff but in visual effects generally not so much so it's more going to be maya houdini stuff like that um so if you're a Cinema 4D user and you want to like, ah, I want to work in visual effects, might be an idea to maybe start learning Houdini or something like that. Or uh, probably even Blender is going to be more likely to give you work inside of visual effects than Cinema 4D. So if you want to do motion design, for example, then Cinema 4D is going to be a great tool. But again, these things depend on the industry that you're going to work in. That's why I'm making this video. So now let's talk a little bit about motion design. And motion design is one of those things that's maybe a little bit hard to understand. At least I found it a little bit confusing when I started out because I mean, motion design is fully animated, right? So you, why, do, why don't you just call it animation? I mean, it's, it's the same, it's like it's fully animated. So we just discussed that something fully animated is animation, right? So there's a difference. So, um, what, what I was talking about before, when animation is mainly character driven. So when you're gonna have animation, you're gonna have like one character, like Bob, and then talking to another guy called uh, Fritz, and then they're talking blah, 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 hello, hello. Well, anyway, you kind of get the point. Um, so it's, it's kind of character driven, and the character is gonna drive the story. And it's not necessarily always the case, but I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, sort of that's generally kind of what when you're just doing a movie it's going to be telling a specific story with characters most of the time emotion design is a little bit different emotion design you're gonna tell a story with uh with visuals with visual design so let's say you're gonna do a commercial for a shoe and so the client is going to come to you and they're going to get what you have to shoe and the shoe is very strong. So if something falls on your on your on your uh, toes and it's not gonna hurt you, um, and it's also water protective and stuff like that. And oh, it's made from some special fiber. So in that case, you're gonna like oh, so I need to tell the story of it's it's gonna be very tough, so tough material. How do I show that it's a tough material? Because I can I can and you can make I can make a render of the material, but that's not telling. Uh, that this is a tough material. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna come up with, with visuals that sort of show that this is a very tough material. Like it might be fibers pulling on each other and like it looks it looks very strong. So something like that. If you're gonna have something be water protective and like do something with drops. Um, so you're, you're, you're gonna be designing visuals to tell a story. So that's kind of the, the difference here. And Motion design can be anything from being very 2D flat stuff, which is abstract colors, to being super high-end, uh, like shoe commercials, like I was mentioning earlier. So, can be any of those of those things, and of course, depending on your interest, you might work in one or the other. That's kind of the main distinction here. So, even though motion design is going to be fully animated. It's, most, it's mostly design-driven animation. So I kind of hope that that kind of makes sense. So the majority of motion designers will probably work in advertising, but of course motion design also happens in, in, in feature film. I mean, if you have like uh, Iron Man and he is looking through his visor and you have a whole bunch of stuff happening on screen, that stuff needs to be designed. It's animated stuff. So that's also motion design. But most of the motion design industry is going to be uh, working in advertising and within motion design there's also obviously going to be a different distinction between actual sort of uh, just doing purely 3d high-end motion design or being more on the side of being a editor that also does some graphics and some logo animations and stuff like that so i used to do a lot of the latter um so i i did i used to do a lot of stuff like for example for a disney channel where i would make um for example 
like small commercials to advertise Disney type product, for example, like a comic book about some Disney thing uh, or from Nickelodeon or stuff like that. Uh, and that would also often be me editing some stuff, then adding some graphics in there, animating some logos. So my title when I did that as a full-time job was creative editor. So that was the title and that kind of fell under branded content. So if you're going to do branded content, essentially you're going to work for a brand that has a already a predefined uh, well style guide, for example, let's say you do something for uh, for like Heineken or something. Heineken has a very strict guideline, like these are our colors, this is the stuff that we want to do, and you're going to do it in their brand guideline, um, which is going to be very different, of course, from just advertising a specific, um, like for example, a specific shoe that might have a, have a specific look, and you're of course going to aim your visuals to match the shoe but it doesn't necessarily need to adhere to the specific branding guidelines of of um of the 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 uh well the the, the brand itself so if you want to do for example like if you like being an editor and then also do some some effect stuff uh aside from that for example just like doing some uh like like um track some video and then add some logos in there or like uh, make a 3D logo animation uh, that's cut in between a video edit, then you're gonna be in that side of the thing. If you mainly just wanna do super high-end 3D stuff, then that's gonna be the other thing. So I started with doing like the more the editing, motion design, the branded content stuff. I didn't really like that that much. That's why I transitioned more into doing effectsy stuff for the higher-end type of uh, 3D because I just personally like that a lot more and it fits just my way of working better um, But that's something to consider Also with motion design working fast is very important um, Much more important than visual effects visual effects will depends like if you're doing visual effects for um, Like if you're doing visual effects for advertising, of course, you're still gonna have very tight deadlines, but if you're going to do branded content, for example, for like edit a video and then add some logos and then do a little 3D thing, that might be something that you need to do in two or three days. While if you're doing a shot for, let's say, a um, like some whatever, some, some Nike commercial or something, uh, you might have a couple of days to do one specific effect. So it's going to be a little bit more time. Uh, and then that's only for the, for the simulation part then. Uh, so it's kind of depends on what you're doing. And if you're actually working in feature film, visual effects, then of course you're gonna have way more time to do anything. Um, so this is also why Cinema 4D, for example, is very big inside of motion design because Cinema 4D is just very easy to quickly get stuff out there. Like just doing simple logo animations, um, just get quick, simple effects going. Very easy, very simple inside of Cinema 4D. The thing why a lot of motion designers are transitioning to using Houdini is because in Cinema 4D you're gonna, you're gonna run into 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 a, a brick wall at some point. Like like it's just very hard to push Cinema 4D beyond a certain point. Um, and in Houdini you don't really have that much of an issue with that. So Houdini would be very uh, would be the most interesting if you're gonna do these higher end uh, motion design type stuff and it's gonna be better over there to like make a whole bunch of, of very heavy type of effects or to, to tens of thousands of variations on a specific effect. While Cinema 4D is gonna be very great if you're gonna be, like I said, like you're gonna be editing some videos and then like adding logo animation in the in, the, in between and then doing some, some other design type of stuff in uh, uh, cut in there, for example, then Cinema 4D is the best tool. So, and when you're compositing, motion design, generally After Effects. Um, because After Effects is, is layer driven and just for motion design. Also, if you're doing 2D motion design, After Effects is just... The, even though a lot of people hate on After Effects, if you're doing this type of stuff, After Effects is, is just the easiest. If you want to uh, work in motion design, kind of make up your mind. Do you want to work more as like an editor? 
that also does some graphics animation and also does a little bit of 3D um, and like have this have this nice nice mix of doing everything. Uh, then Cinema 4D is probably a good tool if you are going to want to do the very high end stuff and really focus on like the effectsy type stuff and simulation type stuff. Then then Houdini might be very interesting to look at. So now let's talk a little bit about architectural visualization. So this is something I personally don't really have a lot of experience in, but I know enough about it that I can explain to you what it is. Uh, I mean, I know enough people who, who do it as well, uh, but I just personally don't work in the field and I don't want to work in the field. But architectural visualization, essentially it's well, creating uh, visualizations to show, uh, for example, what a house looks like, what an interior looks like. Um, you might be surprised to hear that, for example, the IKEA catalog is mostly 3D renders. Like all of the pictures you see in your IKEA catalog, almost all of them are 3D. So that's something that a uh, architectural visualization firm would do. Um, so that would be more on the interior design side, I guess, uh, because that's that's a difference, of course, within like you have uh, really architectural stuff and you have interior design. Uh, so that that's a distinction. But again, I'm not an expert on that field. But also, for example, if you have a uh, some like uh, an, an investor that's gonna that's building houses and they want to sell these houses to potential buyers. Then, of course, these potential buyers don't know what their house is going to look like. So what the firm uh, hires a 3D firm that's going to make a, uh, a 3D visualization of what the house is going to look like. So they make renders and then, then the people who are interested in, in buying these houses before they, they are built, they can just look at these renders. And often these renders are super photorealistic and you wouldn't be able to tell that they are well not real but it kind of also depends i mean for example if if you're talking specifically about interior design and again i'm not an expert in the field i have a couple of very good close friends who do interior design so i, I know some stuff from that side of it but if you're talking about that part uh then i wouldn't even say that you are working in cg you're more working in interior design but cg is still being used there uh, and then it's mostly con used to convey an idea or a mood, sort of say. Because in interior design, of course, it's gonna gonna be more important to sort of convey the idea on how are people gonna use this space. So then photorealism is not necessarily the most important. But if it's if it's used to sell someone a uh, like a apartment, for example, and gonna show you how the apartment looks, in that case, photorealism is very important. Within architectural visualization, um, a lot of it is kit bashing. Essentially what I mean by that is uh, oftentimes they, you just buy models or packs uh, with like trees and furniture and stuff like that. And you light and shade them. And eventually you, you build up a very large catalog of these models. And then you can crank these stuff out, this stuff out pretty quickly. Of course, you will need to have a keen eye for photorealism because photorealism is, of course, very important when you're doing architectural visualization. Um, so, yeah, and architectural visualization, what I notice is that they're also starting to use real time stuff a lot more. Uh, so Unreal is used a lot there. So I guess that's sort of a crossover to games, for example. So like a artist company might work with maybe some game designers to maybe make a uh, make a thing that that you could walk around in, for example. Uh, so I'm gonna gonna call this the Archfist part because, as I said, this is not my my area of expertise. There's probably a whole bunch of channels that you can watch that if you if you're more interested in Archfist. But this is sort of a brief overview. So if you want to do photorealistic rendering of interiors, exteriors, uh, and just really focus on that really that that type of stuff really photoreal things like maybe you have an interest in 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 interior design anyway so that might be something that's interesting for you
So the next subject is going to be scientific visualization, uh, which I also don't have that much experience with. I have done a couple of things, but these can be, well, there it's kind of kind of broad. Like in general, for example, if you have a, for example, a hospital or like a research, like a university that's doing research on like a certain subject, like, uh, like cell divisions or something like that. And they want to have a video showing these like this process um, to show, for example, uh, people who are learning this, how this works. And the main importance with, with, with doing scientific visualization is realism. And then I don't mean realism in the sense that it looks real because often the scientific visualization don't look photo real. Oftentimes they look very far from photo real, like the lighting and shading generally isn't photo real. But what I mean is that, for example, if you're going to do an animation on how a certain type of cancer, for example, would grow and expand and, and, and would, or, or let's say, or a virus would attack uh, a healthy cell and replicate and stuff like that. The main importance is going to be uh, like taking, like, like, like looking at how does this work in real life? And then transfer transferring that to doing uh, well into into a visualization where visual effects, for example, or motion design will be abstract of reality, where you don't necessarily need it to be needed to match. Like if you're doing something with visual effects, like as long as it looks cool and looks good, it doesn't matter if it matches physics, as long as it looks cool. In uh, if you're doing scientific visualization it actually behaving like it would in real life is the most important thing. Actually, an interesting thing that I did recently, which was for more of a, it was a, it was a visual effects thing. It was, um, it was a commercial for some dog food that, uh, yeah, it like it, it was some antibacterial dog food anyway. So, uh, they, they've been, they were working on this since forever and, and the scientists, at well at, at the client were always like yeah but it's not it's not what it looks like in real life so i was brought on to like make some additional changes because they didn't really have time to 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 pick it up themselves um and well the, you had the scientists and they they literally described in a document about how this how this 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 white blood cell eats up this 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 virus <laughs> <laughs> and it really looked like like some like this blood cell just like has like these tentacles and then it gets like a sort of a mouthy anus thing and then it eats this thing and it looked I, I just made that <laughs> and it, it it looked disgusting but I know I was joking to the producers but well oh my god it would be so funny if this was approved <laughs> it was instantly approved because the scientists were like oh my god this is exactly what it what it should look like so that was that was kind of hilarious uh i'm not even sure like if that is the actual thing that made it onto tv i, I haven't seen the final thing but it was uh, <laughs> it, it was absolutely hilarious uh yeah so anyway scientific visualization realism is more important in more in terms of all the simpsons build so if you want to really like build custom solvers for example inside of houdini that really replicate real life uh, uh real life stuff that might be something interesting for you so now let's talk a little bit about video games so like i mentioned before i don't really work in the games industry um i find real time very interesting and it's really something i do want to try at some point uh, I've been thinking about maybe giving Unreal Engine a go and just make me making sort of my own short sequence in Unreal, try to figure out this whole real time thing. But I don't have a lot of experience in there. I've, I've never worked in a game studio. So I don't have a lot of experience with that, uh, in, in that area. I do know a lot of people in the games industry, but it's going to be more of a global overview, just like with architectural visualization and scientific visualization. So of course, if we're talking about games, games need to run in real time. So, of course, uh, there's is going to be way different from doing all, from from doing just regular offline rendering that you're going to do inside of visual effects. In visual effects, as long as you can make something, you get it through the render. 
then it's fine. Like you need to optimize, of course, but as long as it can render in reasonable time, then it's fine. Even if there's little, little, little errors or mistakes, compositing can fix them, fix it in post. Um, in games, none of that luxury. Of course, it needs to run in real time. You're of course very uh, working on very limited hardware because even if you're gonna develop for a, for let's say a PC, uh, like a high-end PC, it still needs to run on on like on a potato PC as well, or like maybe a smartphone. So you always need to uh, need to uh, keep the lowest denominator denominator in mind. So optimizations are very important in this uh, in this area. Of course, games have also been getting bigger, um, uh, requiring more assets. So Houdini is is been getting more and more uh, relevant inside the games industry because of its procedural nature. Like you can generate. Uh, procedural buildings and, and uh, procedural uh, landscapes and a whole bunch of cool cool stuff like that. So Houdini has really been been getting bigger and bigger and bigger in that industry. Apart from that, it's just whatever, like studios might use whatever. Some studios will use 3ds Max, some will use Maya, some will use even Blender. The games industry is super broad. Um, I mean, the good thing about games is also that you can, you can even, with three friends, you can even start your own little games company make an indie game if it does well well then then you're set which is of course a lot more difficult uh, when you're doing like animation it's it's much more difficult to sort of monetize a, a animation that you make yourself well it is perfectly possible to like make your own game even by yourself and go ahead and sell it and then you can use whatever you want you could you could use blender you could use houdini you could use whatever you want um and of course if you're going to do that then you like then you're then you're a true generous you're doing everything maybe if you're splitting work with a friend like your friend might do most of the coding and you do you might do most of the 3d you might have like uh like an artist like maybe designing some stuff but uh like there's a lot of possibilities there if you're gonna work at bigger studios of course then you're again you're gonna be more maybe more of a specialist um like if you're gonna look at the very big studios they have well you know they have tds working mainly on tools uh, they have artists working on assets. It's 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 a very well, it's it's a very big industry in itself. You could probably do an entire video like this just on games with separate categories within games. Um, but again, like I did want to include this, even though it's a little bit out of the scope of the stuff that I normally do, because it's of course very important. But um, yeah, I mean, games are a definite option. Um, just keep in mind, this is a very, it's a very different industry. It's uh, stuff needs to uh, needs to run in real time. Lately, there there have been a lot of crossovers with the real time ray tracing going on. Uh, Unreal Engine Five now uh, with all of the new new features allowing you to really uh, load in high resolution models. So I do personally see in the future a lot of crossover of maybe visual effects studios or motion design studios starting to use maybe Unreal Engine to also start making videos so i think there's gonna be sort of a a mix between these two you already see that happening there's now visual effects uh uh, uh, uh shoots happening uh, where they're ex actually using real-time environments to shoot so the mandalorian used actually a real engine if i'm correct um to have like actual uh, real-time environments in the shoot and of course that's going to make a huge difference for actors that that can actually look around and then on these led panels around them um, if you know a lot about real time now so if you are in the games industry or if you are in the visual effects industry i, I really think these are going to blend together at some point and and i really think that that at some point everybody will probably need to get into some type of real-time stuff because they are really converging so even if you're doing visual effects Thing real time will be making a much bigger impact and if you're already in the games industry then uh, of course you already know a lot of these things so it's going to be super interesting times um, so yeah I mean about games like I said I don't work in the industry myself but there's a lot of possibilities there's a lot of channels dedicated to making games on YouTube but I hope this was sort of a good brief overview over what the possibilities might be within that and there's even uh, there's there's even studios going from like visual effects and, and transitioning into doing, to doing games like uh, for example Kin, uh, which is a game by House of Secrets. They started off as a visual effects studio, uh, and then they put all of their efforts into really becoming a real time and game studio. They've also done a lot of really cool VR 
uh, video clips and other stuff like that. So I highly suggest you check it out. I'll leave, a, I'll leave a link in the description. They make super cool stuff. And check out their game kin as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, industries are going to converge and, and, and real time stuff is, is very, very interesting in that regard. So yeah, that kind of rounds up all of the things. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this sort of, uh, this, well, not a brief vlog because I, I have been talking for quite a while now, but I really hope you enjoyed it. And I really hope you kind of helped, it kind of helped make up your mind on kind of what you want to put your focus on. Uh, I mean, if you want, like, if you want to know more about any of these specific industries, uh, I'd be glad to do another video on any of these specific industries. Probably, uh, like I mentioned before, I personally work in mostly in visual effects and motion design and like some animation stuff. So if I'm going to do more videos, it's probably going to be in that area. So if you want to know more about those, let me know in the comments and I'll gladly do another video going more into depth about specific, fill, uh, uh, about specific skills that are useful in these industries. Uh, software that's generally used, uh, things that you need to keep in mind whenever you want to try to land a job in these types of uh, industries and more of that stuff. So anyway, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to absolutely destroy the like button if you haven't done it already when I mentioned it in the beginning of the, of the video. So if you didn't do it already, here's another chance. Uh, and make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon if you want to stay notified whenever I post new videos. So aside from these vlogs, I do very regular uh, tutorials. Uh, the tutorials I do are mainly focused on doing stuff in Houdini. Uh, so I have a Houdini beginner course, course called Houdini 101, which I upload new episodes of every five days. Uh, I have another course called Pyrofluid, which I which are also upload new episodes every five days. Uh, playlists are on my channel, so if you're interested in those, check them out. And uh, yeah, without further ado, um, I hope you enjoy this and until next time, guys, peace.